everyone, my name is Annie Rogers, and on behalf of the Attitude team, I am pleased to welcome you to today's ADHD Experts presentation. It's titled Body-Focused Repetitive Behaviors and ADHD, Helping Your Child with Hair Pulling and Skin Picking. Leading today's presentation is Dr. Suzanne Mutan Odom. Dr. Mutan Odom is a licensed uh, psychologist and a leader in the field of body-focused repetitive behaviors, or BFRBs, as well as anxiety disorders and other obsessive compulsive and related disorders. She has served on the scientific advisory board for the TLC Foundation for BFRBs for more than 20 years and has published several books and numerous journal articles in the BFRB space. In addition to doing research and writing about BFRBs and its effective treatments, Dr. Mutan Odom has treated hundreds of individuals and their families. She recently co-authored a guide for clinicians um, with Cambridge University Press that will be available next month, so please keep your eye out. In today's webinar, we will gain a deeper understanding of chronic hair pulling and skin picking, conditions that are really seldom discussed openly. Caregivers like yourselves, you want to know, how do I lovingly and effectively support my child who is battling these behaviors? Our expert today will talk about common myths, triggers, what good treatment looks like, and what you can do to help. We'd like to begin today's webinar by asking a short poll question to our live audience. What have you noticed triggers your child's BFRB? Please select your answers and you can comment in the text box under the video player to tell us more. You will see the poll results as soon as you submit your response and then we'll circle back at the end to let you know the results. While you do that, I will point out that live participants may submit questions anytime during the live event. To download the slides, check, check on the event resources section of your webinar screen. If you're interested in the certificate of attendance, just look for instructions in an email you will get uh, later on today. A transcript of today's event will also be made available in the coming week. If you are listening in replay or podcast mode, just visit attitudemag.com and search for podcast number 453 to access the slides, the replay, certificate of attendance, and transcript. If you support the work we're doing here at Attitude to strengthen the ADHD community, we encourage you to visit attitudemag.com slash subscribe. You can sign up now and you will receive our summer issue with tips on how to manage teen stress, scripts on reflective listening for parents, um, and audiobooks for that summer reading. Um, sign up for Attitude Magazine for yourself or gift it to someone who could benefit from greater ADHD understanding. Finally, we do have a sponsor for today's webinar, and that is Play Attention. NASA-inspired technology that improves executive function and self-regulation. For more than 25 years, Play Attention has been helping children and adults thrive and succeed. Tufts University School of Medicine found Play Attention significantly improved attention, executive function, academic performance, and behavioral control of ADHD students. Your program will include a lifetime membership and a personal executive function coach to customize your plan along the way. Home and professional programs are available. You can call 828-676-2240 or click the link on the screen to schedule your free one-on-one -on -one consultation. You can also visit playattention.com to learn more. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Please know sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. So with all of that out of the way, um, thank you so much for joining us today, um, Dr. Suzanne Mutan Odom. Uh, we are so excited for you to lead this discussion about body-focused repetitive behaviors. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me and um, thank you all for being here. We're gonna kind of start by going through what BFRBs are why people pull and pick, um, 
who is more likely to engage in these behaviors, why they engage in these behaviors. We'll get a little into how you guys as parents or clinicians can be most helpful. And we'll save time at the end for some questions. But I wanted to start by saying, I'm assuming many of you listeners are parents, how hard this is. And I just want to acknowledge that because it's in many ways, I think it's harder for parents going through this than it is for the actual child. And I want you to really listen with an open heart and, um, and, and really some compassion for yourself in going through this, because I just want to acknowledge how, how hard it is for a parent to walk this journey with their child. And hopefully we will, I will be able to give you some strategies and some, um, some ways that you can be most helpful to your child struggling with the BFRB. So we'll go ahead and get started with what are BFRBs. So the most common body-focused repetitive behaviors are trichotillomania, which is hair pulling disorder, and excoriation disorder, which is skin picking. Hair pulling is um, any hair on the body could be pulled. Scalp hair, eyelashes, and eyebrows are the three top and most common but fourth is pubic hair, um, arm hair, leg hair, it, really any body hair. In males, adult males, it could be facial hair. Um, so really any, any hair on the body is, is possibly to be pulled. And then excoriation disorder or skin picking disorder is, um, it involves you know, nail biting, nail picking, skin picking, um, acne excoriation in teenagers. Um, and, and we have a list of common other BFRBs, in, including nail biting, nose picking, um, lip biting, cheek biting, nail or cuticle picking, and, and really any other picking behavior. The first two, trichotillomania and skin picking disorder, are listed in the D Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. The other ones aren't listed specifically, but they're called other obsessive compulsive and related disorders, just to hopefully clarify any confusion. So who can get a BFRB? The prevalence rates are about two to 5% um, that we know of. It's also really hard to get these data because most people that pull their hair and pick their skin aren't talking about it. And so really we're trying to understand a population of people that is in hiding or isn't talking about their behavior. Um, but, but those are the latest um, prevalence rates that we have. The gender distribution Interestingly, under the age of, say, 12 or 13 is about 50-50. And after puberty, we see it more heavily weighted toward the female side. Now, we don't know if this is because more women actually pull and pick, or it could be because more girls start in puberty, or it could be because males don't report it. They're able to shave their face or you know, they're able to um, have male pattern baldness or, or say that that's what's causing it. And so we're not 100% sure what this discrepancy is about. Um, and a later study that was done recently showed not such a big split between males and females and adults. Age of onset is usually between 11 and 13, so right at the age of puberty, although we do see a class of kiddos that start pulling in, in really early childhood, as young as six months of age, 12 months of age, I saw a 20-month-old yesterday, um, but really from zero to six, we call that baby trick. And we treat that a little bit differently because the intervention is almost exclusively done with parents. Um, it would be hard to do therapy with a two-year-old. So um, the role of genetics, what we do know is that these disorders do run in families. And I did notice there were a lot of questions in the queue about um, a parent that also had a BFRB and their child, maybe not the same. So a parent might pull hair and the child might pick skin or bite nails. Um, but we do see that these behaviors tend to run in families. As far as com comorbidities go, and this is the reason I'm on the show because this is about ADHD, we do see high comorbidity with ADHD and hair pulling and skin picking. It's for hair pulling about 30, 32% and skin picking about 26%, meaning that they have both, which is a pretty high comorbidity given that um, ADHD in the general population is a much lower figure. So, we, so I'm so thrilled to be here talking to you guys today because it's highly relevant. And then we also see high rates of sensory dysregulation. And what that means is kiddos who are adults who have really um, interesting wired nervous systems, not necessarily autism spectrum disorder, although it could be, but um, what that means is more kiddos who have sensitivities to taste or sound or tactile sensations or um, 
smell or any of the sensory nervous system responses and, and, and have struggles in that area. We also see that BFRBs are highly related to sensory experiences, and we're going to talk about that here in a minute. So common myths and misconceptions about BFRBs. I just want to clear up a few things, and a lot of these were in the question queue, so I wanted to go ahead and address them. One common myth is that BFRBs are the result of abuse, bad parenting, or some form of trauma. We do not see this, okay? But it's a very common question or assumption that people make that there must be something bad that happened to this person that's causing them to engage in these behaviors. That is not true. Now, we do see in about 50% of people with a BFRB that they will report something was going on at the time that it started. Maybe parents are going through a divorce or the dog died or they're, you know, changed schools because of a move. And so oftentimes, 50% of the time kids or adults will report there was something going on, but it's certainly not um, some like sexual abuse or some form of serious trauma. Now, I'm not saying that that can't have occurred. It certainly can, but that is not the reason um, causing the BFRB. So the second myth is that BFRBs are just a form of OCD. And I want to clarify that too. Um, now, they, they're, not, they're not the same thing. They might be considered distant cousins and they're, now they're called related disorders, OCD and related disorders. So it gets a little confusing, but the main similarity being that it is a repetitive unwanted behavior. And that's about where the similarity ends. Um, because they have some very different um, phenomenology and very different treatment. And, um, and really the process going on with each of these is very different. So it's not exactly like OCD. Um, the third myth is that BFRBs, BFRBs lead to other more dangerous psychopathology. We do not see, and, and this is a big concern of parents, is my child going to become suicidal or have anorexia or become bipolar what does this mean for the future of my child? And, and what we know is that we can't predict anything that should come because your child has a BFRB. We do see higher rates of depression and generalized anxiety disorder in adults with BFRBs, but we're not sure why that is, if they're somehow related or if maybe just having a lifetime of struggling with a BFRB is somehow causing or leading someone to feel more depressed or more anxious. Uh, the fourth, and I hear this one a lot, is that BFRBs are a form of self-harm or self-mutilation. And I really want to be clear on this because there's a lot going on in the internet right now that's really promoting this belief. And, and BFRBs are, are not that. In fact, they're more, more likely a form of self-regulation and self-soothing than self-harm or self-mutilation. Those behaviors are very different processes and are associated with different psychopathology than BFRBs. So I really want you to hear that. Uh, the next one is that BFRBs are easy to stop and within a person's control. Well, if that were the case, I would not have a job and none of us would be here because they're not easy to stop. It's sort of like any behavior and maybe think about behaviors that you've engaged in that you've tried to stop in the past and maybe struggled with. Maybe it's losing five or 10 pounds. Maybe it's starting an exercise program. Maybe it's starting a meditation practice. It's hard. Behaviors are entrenched in our, in our daily lives and changing a behavior takes effort and time and energy and they're not easy to change. And so We'll talk a little bit more about what's involved with changing behavior because it is possible. I just want to say it's not easy and it's not necessarily within someone's direct control. BFRBs are a sign of dislike for oneself or a desire to be unattractive. And, and again, this is a myth and not true. Uh, most people with a BFRB cannot stand the result of their BFRB. Okay, and I liken it to say eating chocolate cake, and I use food analogies a lot because most of us can relate to them. But um, I might like eating the chocolate cake, but I don't really like the result of eating too much chocolate cake. And so it's not because I'm not eating the chocolate cake because I want to be overweight or unhealthy. I'm eating it because it tastes good. So most people with a BFRB will tell you. They don't like the outcome of their BFRB, but they really do like doing their BFRB. 
So the truth about BFRBs, the truth about hair pulling and skin picking is that they're self-soothing, self-regulating behaviors. And we're going to look at internal and external cues and reinforcing factors that over time become ingrained in this person's daily activities and habits and oftentimes become almost automatic. And that's sort of the process with which these unfold. Um, they occur in children and adults who are otherwise high functioning, lovely, normal, psychologically intact, intelligent and creative individuals. So this is not a group of um, strange or unusual people. This is a group of you guys are in good company. And so are the parents. I always this is why I love working with people with BFRBs, because they're really actually amazing, lovely human beings. BFRBs are treatable and should not define a person or become the center of family structure. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. And um, they're only one small part of your child and, and should not define them on any level. And, and sometimes that gets messy in families because as parents, we try to help our child and, and, and we focus on the things that we want to help them with. And so we want to be real careful about that. So why do people pull and pick? The bottom line is BFRBs are functional behavior. So what does that mean? And I mentioned a little while ago, internal and external triggers. So we're going to break that down. Internal triggers happen within the body, sort of like hunger, thirst. They need to go to the bathroom. They're internal. Um, and those involve sensory, emotional, and cognitive. So sensory is, it could be an urge, like um, a sensation, People will often talk about like an itch on their eyelid that's calling their attention to that spot. Or it could be seeing something, a visual trigger, like I see a hair that's out of place, or I see a, a pimple or a bump, or I feel an area on my body that feels rough or feels unusual or bumpy. Um, so so sensory experiences can, can be any of the sensations. And sometimes these occur after. So the aftermath of pulling might be looking at the hair or stroking the hair or rubbing that little moist bulb that's at the end of the hair along the face and seeing how that feels or wrapping the hair around the finger or looking at the, th the excoriate that comes out of the skin or tasting it or smelling it. So all kinds of behaviors are, are common and play into the why is this person engaging in this behavior. Cognitions are thoughts. So sometimes people have beliefs about their hair pulling or skin picking. Beliefs can be like, this will help me concentrate, or I have to pull all these coarse, wiry hairs out. Um, this pimple needs to be picked or it won't heal. Or sometimes people are just thinking about life problems. They're thinking about worries or making decisions or thinking about problems going on with their life. But oftentimes that thought process goes along with the, the BFRB. And then finally, affective or emotional internal triggers or reinforcing factors are, um, you know, we talk a lot about anxiety and people have this assumption that anxiety is what triggers a BFRB. And I would say that's true some of the time for most people with the BFRB, just sort of like some of the time I'm hungry before I eat, not all of the time. Um, sometimes I'm in a restaurant, I'm not really hungry, but I'm there and everyone else is eating. It's the appropriate thing to do. Sometimes I'm not hungry, but mm, boy, that cookie looks really good, but I'm not really hungry. So it could be, I, I experiencing, I smelled the cookie. Ooh, that makes me want to eat it. So, so there are all kinds of, of experiences that can, um, can, can help us, can lead us to a behavior. So it's not always tension or anxiety. It's oftentimes boredom excitement, worry, um, anger, frustration, happiness, relax, you know, feeling relaxed or calm. And then we also want to look at the reinforcing factors, which is what happens after we pull or pick. And sometimes we see that a person feels more relaxed or more at peace, but oftentimes we see that a person feels guilty, angry, frustrated, mad at themselves, um, and, and shameful for engaging in the behavior or is frightened. Oh my gosh, I now have a, a bald spot on my head that I have to cover. Um, or I'm bleeding and somebody's going to notice this. Um, and, all, and, and what we see is that sometimes those negative emotions following hair pulling or skin picking episode can actually lead to another hair pulling or skin picking episode. 
So in therapy, we want to break this down and really understand all of the internal cues and triggers that happened before, as well as the reinforcing factors that happened after the pulling or picking episode. We also want to look at external triggers. External triggers are things that happen outside of our body. These could be motoric movements. Um, these could be positional things like having my arm resting on the desk with my hand right here. And it's, then I start stroking my hair and then I start feeling for hair. Um, even without my awareness until I find one that I might want to pull and then I might become aware that I'm having an urge to pull. We want to know that. We want to know places that make a person more likely to pull or pick. Common places involve the classroom, the bathroom, the bedroom, sometimes the car on a long road trip. Um, so we want to look at common places for that individual. Also activities. What is the child or what is the person doing at the time of the hair pulling or skin picking behavior? Um, common activities would be um, looking in the mirror, um, getting in or out of the shower. So those are bathroom activities, sitting on the toilet where you're, you're kind of stuck um, in bed, getting trying to go to sleep or in the morning um, after waking up in the car, driving, um, focusing, studying, reading, studying for tests, taking a test. So these are all activities that we commonly hear are associated with engagement with the BFRB. And we want to look at automatic motoric movements that might be outside of one's awareness. Like I mentioned earlier, just mindlessly playing with one's hair, mindlessly stroking one's skin until you find something that feels interesting. So sometimes the behavior begins mindlessly and then becomes more um, intentional. And sometimes it stays mindless throughout the whole thing. A person might kind of look down and go, oh my gosh, there's a whole pile of hair there. I didn't even realize I was engaging in the behavior. Time of day. Um, most common time of day is evening, but some kiddos will tell us they pull in the morning um, on the way to school, worrying about a test. Um, some, so we want to look at for that particular individual, what time of day makes them more likely to pull and or pick. And then implements. Um, the use of tweezers, mirrors, especially magnifying mirrors, bright lights, um, anything that would be used or increase the likelihood that the behavior will happen. And, and it's all important in therapy. And, and interestingly, it can be different. So for, e for each individual, across individuals, but also within individuals. So for example, I might pull my hair in the morning in the bathroom before school but at night or in the afternoon, it might be in my bedroom, at my desk, while I'm studying and I'm um, feeling more worried. And then again at night, in bed, when I'm trying to fall asleep and I'm not even aware of it. So all of these things can, can apply to an individual, but in different situations. So it's a little bit confusing when you're seeing all of these different things and trying to make sense of it. So the most common question that I get from parents is, why can't my child stop? And as I mentioned earlier, behavior change is hard, even for, even for us. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, behavior is hard, especially behavior that's been hanging around for a long time. And I often ask parents, have you ever put something in your mouth that you probably shouldn't have? And most people, if they're telling the truth, will say, yes, I have. And then I'll ask, well, did you do it knowingly? Like when you put it in your mouth, did you know I probably shouldn't put this in my mouth? And the answer is sometimes yes, sometimes no. Believe it or not, I can sit there at a Mexican restaurant and eat the entire bucket of chips and salsa and not even know that I ate the whole bucket of chips or basket. Um, and, and so sometimes awareness is slippery. I know I'm eating chips, but I didn't realize I had however many I had. And then sometimes we know, I know I shouldn't eat this, but I really want it. And we do it anyway. Well, this is the same thing for BFRBs. So it sounds good. I know I don't want to do this behavior. I want to change my behavior. I would like to stop pulling my hair. But in that moment, in the right, in the right atmosphere with the right activity and the right triggers, it's very hard to stop. And so therapy involves changing all of that, knowing the, the micro details of a person's behavior so that we can change it up and make them uh, cause them to be more successful. Ambivalence is very common. 
um, and people with BFRBs. And, and this is also true with a, a lot of different behaviors that are self-regulating, um, whether it's eating or, or smoking cigarettes or drinking alcohol or laying on the couch instead of going to exercise. It sounds good, but in the moment, oh, this is what I really want to do. And so this is what I'm going to do. Um, and, and so we, we have to understand that while a child might want to grow their hair back or have their skin heal in that moment, that's very hard to resist um, because most people really enjoy engaging in their BFRB. Um, even though oftentimes they'll tell you, no, I hate it. I hate my BFRB. I don't want to do this anymore. Most of the time, what they're talking about is the outcome of their BFRB. And, um, you know, I'll be honest, I really do like eating the chocolate cake, but it's the outcome of eating the chocolate cake that I don't like, um, if, if that makes more sense. So BFRBs are functional. They help to get some need met, whether that's um, a cognitive belief like, like I need to focus and my hair pulling will help me focus. Therefore, I'm going to pull my hair because I'm taking the SAT and that makes sense to me. Or I, um, I feel soothed by my BFRB. I love the way the hair feels when I rub it along my face afterwards. And that gives me this soothing, calming feeling. So we have to, in therapy, find out what is the function of the behavior so that we can then provide that input or provide that sensation to the person so that they can get the need met in a different way without causing harm to their body. Um, and it also changes the way we think about it. Somehow now it's less pathological. It's less um, hor like awful. It is, oh, my child is just trying, has found a way to regulate their nervous system. That's not something that feels good to me. So I don't understand how that feels good to them, but I know that it does. And so it helps us develop compassion for people and understanding that their behaviors, they're engaging in these behaviors because it feels good in some way to them. And then you might be inadvertently contributing to the cycle. So we want to look at parent accommodation. We want to look at parent responses so that we can understand if there are subtle things that parents are doing that um, are contributing to it. And the most common I like to call is fertilizing the weeds. So you have your garden, your garden is your child and all of their qualities. We really want to fertilize the flowers. These are their, their strengths, their attributes, the, the, the things that, about them that are amazing. And what ends up happening is we focus on the things that aren't going well. We focus on the pulling or picking, even in the face of the flowers. And when we do that, we give attention to the wrong thing. We give attention to the weeds and that's what grows. Good example, child runs in, mommy, mommy, daddy, daddy, I made an A on my math test. And they're so excited. And you look at your child and you see they've wiped out all their eyelashes and eyebrows. A common reaction might be to say, oh my gosh, what happened to your eyelashes and eyebrows? And, and miss the opportunity to praise the child for making the A on their math test and celebrate that later, later, hours later, you can say, hey, I noticed that maybe you had a hard time today. Do you want to talk about that? Um, so we really want to make sure that we're focusing on, on, on the flowers. So what does good treatment look like? Cognitive behavior, behavioral therapy is the evidence-based treatment of choice for BFRBs. And I've been talking about it. So we're looking at the behavior um, and in all aspects. And in this sense, we're looking at internal cues and reinforcing factors, which means it's, we call it the ABC model, the antecedent, which is what happened just before the behavior, which is the pulling or picking and the co consequence, which is what is the outcome, what happened just afterwards. And we want to really understand what's going on with this behavior, what makes it more likely to happen and, and what reinforces it so that we can change those things to reduce the likelihood that that behavior will happen and also to get that need met in a different way which brings me to understanding the functional basis for the behavior and utilizing fun function-based interventions. We want this child to get those needs met. Like in the little bitty children, like uh, the 20 month old I saw yesterday is a thumb sucker and t puts the hair around the thumb and then sucks. Doesn't eat the hair, but just uses that as a sensory piece of her pulling. 
And so we have to really understand that. And what we ended up finding was this amazing, soft, um, it's like a hairband that was super furry. And she immediately put it on her wrist. And then when she wanted to suck her thumb, she would take it off and rub it like this while she was sucking her thumb. And, and it was an amazing, and hopefully that's something that can help to get that need met for having something kind of rubbing that's soft on her face while she's sucking her thumb. Uh, because we want her to get that need met of self-soothing soothing and self-regulation. Um, so there's excellent information and a list of trained therapists and treating BFRBs um, available on the Trichotillomania, uh, the TLC Foundation for BFRBs website. It used to be called the Trichotillomania Learning Center. And sorry, that was um, way back 10 years ago. But now it's called the TLC Foundation. Their um, website is bfrb.org. They have amazing resources there. They have groups where parents can meet, group where, groups where adults and kids can meet to meet other people who engage in BFRBs. Um, and currently the TLC Foundation endorses the COME model or the comprehensive behavioral model, which is what I'm describing to you. And the book that um, they mentioned earlier is a clinical treatment guide based on the COME manual. So what as parents can you do to help your child? And, and if you do nothing else, and if you hear nothing else from me today, hear compassion and understanding. So our job as parents is to help, right? And that's what, that's what we're supposed to do. And so it kind of makes sense that you see a behavior and you go, oh, we need to change that behavior. That doesn't look right. My child pulled half his hair out or his eyebrows, or my child has picked a hole in his skin and it's it, it, it won't go away. It keeps happening. And so in the beginning, what we see as parents saying, hey, let's not do that anymore, very kindly. And then the behavior might stop, but then it restarts again. Wait, we talked about this. Don't do that. Stop it. And then the child might, might start hiding it, might start doing it outside of your awareness. And then you see, because you can see that it's still happening. Well, wait, why is this still happening? I told you not to do that anymore. Then parents get frustrated. Um, and because of all the mis and misconceptions that I mentioned earlier, parents can start to get scared. Did something happen to my child? Did somebody abuse my child? Is somebody going to think I abused my child? Is somebody going to think I'm a bad parent? Um, and so we want to be very careful to remember that the, those mis and misconceptions are not accurate. Um, so our job is to help, but let's talk about some ways that we can help. We can help by developing compassion and understanding. So help with BFRBs looks a bit, a little bit different. We want you to be the soft pillow. We want you to be the support, to be the, um, the person that's there to hold your child's emotion, to hold your child's struggle as they go through this journey. Okay. And it's not to fix it. It's not to fix it. So sometimes help looks like saying nothing. And that's really hard for parents. And when I say say nothing, it means no side eye glances, no dirty looks, no, you know, no noises. No, I told you, no grabbing their hand and pulling it away. It is, it is for many parents, the best thing is to say nothing. And I always ask, I ask my child, I ask all my clients, what would be helpful for you? What would help, what would be helpful for your mom and dad to do? And what would feel supportive? And, and usually they don't say, I want my mom and dad to tell me to stop. So again, we have to be, we have to be on the same team as our child. Um, helping does not mean fixing. Love unconditionally. Your child needs to hear, I love you no matter what. Because what can happen is if all the child hears is about hair, Oh, look at her. Her eyelashes are so cute. Or you look so pretty. Look at this picture of you when you were four and you had such pretty eyelashes. What your child hears is, well, I don't look pretty anymore. I must be ugly because I don't have any eyelashes. And that's why you have to be very careful when a child's going through treatment and doing better. Our instinct is to say, oh my gosh, it looks so good. Look how good you look with your eyelashes growing or your hair is growing out. And, and that's, that's a really uncomfortable thing for a child to hear because what they hear is, well, now I have to keep it this way or I won't look pretty or, or my mom won't be proud of me. My dad won't be proud of me. 
And so we kind of want to take hair and skin off of the table as discussion points. In therapy, we really focus on engagement, engagement with whatever the treatment plan is that the therapist comes up with. Is the child engaged? Are they using their interventions, their strategies? Are they doing the things that we talk about doing? And if they are, that's all that matters. It's sort of like if I do my exercise and eat healthy, the weight's going to eventually come off. I don't have to weigh myself every day. So we focus on the behaviors that we can measure and we focus on um, the things that we can see and we don't focus on hair and skin. Res resist the urge to police. And in our book, um, A Parent Guide to Hair Pulling Disorder, we talk about release, don't police. And it's resist the urge to micromanage the behavior. Resist the urge, unless your child asks you to. Mom, I really want you to tell me when I'm pulling or picking because I don't know when it's happening. That's great. If it's coming from your child, that's great. But, but most of the time that feels naggy, that feels negative and that feels uncomfortable to kids. And, um, you know, I, I talk to parents a lot. And, and one of the examples I give is, you know, if I was about to eat a donut and my husband said, hey, don't eat that, that will make you fat. How does that make me feel? Does that make me feel like, oh, I don't want to eat the donut anymore. Thanks, honey. That makes me feel, thanks for letting me know that. Probably not. It probably makes me angry, frustrated, and makes me want to eat three donuts and pitch one at him. And thankfully, my husband doesn't say things like that, but it doesn't improve our motivation to change our behavior by telling someone not to do something in the moment that they really want to do it. And so a better thing might be a distraction. Hey, you want to go on a walk? Oh my goodness, I need your help in the kitchen. Will you come help me with this? Um, if your child says it's okay to hand them a fidget, one that they've said would be helpful to them. Um, or a simple question, is there something I can do to help you right now? Those are much better ways to support your child than instructing them to do the thing that they already know they probably should do. Or it's out of their, what I see a lot is kids who are really unaware of it will say, I don't want my parents to say anything. Please don't say anything. And I ask them, please don't say anything for the next week. Well, the next week we come back and if they followed that, oftentimes the child will say, yes, mom and dad didn't say anything. And I wish they would. I wish they would say, you know, maybe a code word, like, I don't know, supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, something that will remind me that I'm doing it. I need to stop. But now it's coming from the child. It's not coming from you. And it's a much healthier way to address it. Or I just want mom to give me a hug or hold my hand or, um, or just walk out of the room. So oftentimes we're working together as a team to figure out what feels like support, not policing and not nagging. And the other piece is focus on other aspects of your child. Focus on the flowers, all the most amazing things about your child and, um, their, their strengths, their sports, their dance, their ability to play, I don't know, Minecraft or whatever they like to do. That's what we want to focus on. Or their kindness, um, th their ability to be a good friend. And, and that's what we want to focus on and take, take the um, focus off of hair and skin. Now, a lot of parents will say, but, but if we don't work on this, they're going to get teased. And I'm just trying to help them not get teased. And of course, we don't want our children to get teased, um, but many of them will, and, and many of them will get teased for things other than hair pulling and skin picking. Most people will say they got teased at some point in their childhood. Um, and because, you know, two to 5% of people engage in a BFRB, most of us weren't pulling our hair, picking our skin. So it's probably going to happen anyway. And a better approach would be to really prepare our child for, well, how would you handle that? If somebody did say something, what would you say back? Like, hey, why don't you have any eyelashes or eyebrows? Now we're talking about skills and now we're arming them with some tools or ammunition to, to have something to say or to do. And there are a million right answers. And I always work with the child of what feels comfortable to them and what makes sense to them and, um, 
and what what they're willing to share. You know, some kids will say, I have trichotillomania, go look it up, knowing that most people can't spell that word in fourth grade. And so, and, and that can make other kids go, what? And not feel very smart. So, but some kids aren't comfortable with that sharing and they just want to say, it's none of your business or, you know, whatever, and, and find a way to escape that without internalizing it and, um, and feeling negatively about it. And that's really the, the biggest risk as you know, when you think about being a parent, what do you want for your child? What do you want your child? What do you, what do you want the outcome of all your parenting effort to be? And usually what I hear when in response to that question is, um, I want my child to like themselves and to be a responsible human who, um, you know, is, is taking care of, is able to take care of themselves and is a kind person. Um, and, and so when we reframe it, we see that, um, focusing on hair pulling and skin picking probably isn't going to get us there. And what we want to, our child to know is that we love them no matter what, no matter what hair, no hair, um, it, it doesn't matter. They're still an amazing human being. Okay. So I really want you to remember that. And sometimes it takes just reminding yourself every day of all the cool things about your child, everything that they do. That's amazing. And, or anything they do, that's amazing. Sometimes children are at that challenging age and it's harder to identify those things. Um, and then they go into an age that's easier. So, so love your child unconditionally and tell them so, honey, I don't care if you have hair or not. Hair does not make you a special person. There are plenty, believe me, I see plenty of people with lots and lots of hair that are not happy, you know, cause I, I treat people with all kinds of different psychological problems. I also people see people that have a lack of hair for one reason or another. Sometimes they pull it. Sometimes they just have thinning hair or male pattern baldness and they're extremely happy people. And so hair does not equal happiness. So we have to be careful not to fall into that thinking trap. Um, ask your child what he or she needs from you to help them feel supported and loved. Ask them, right? That's a better use of your time talking about BFRBs than, um, than nagging or reminding or, or, you know, throwing strategies at them. When there is a setback, because there are setbacks, you know, you'll do well for a while and then the child comes home and they've done a big wipeout. Um, we want to use that as an opportunity to focus on problem solving. Oh my goodness, what happened? Again, maybe not right when they walk in the door, after things calm down, after they've had a snack, maybe later in the evening. Well, let's talk about what happened today. What was different about today? And go into problem solving mode. Did, were you missing something? Did you not have your strategies? Did you forget? Okay. Oh, that was a really hard test. All right. Because sometimes that's the bit of information that was missing. Oh, I got in a fight with my friend and I was really sad about it. I was really worried she wasn't going to be my friend anymore. That's great information. Well, well, let's talk about what could you have done differently in that moment? How, how might you handle that differently next time? Now we've moved into problem solving and healing and also really talking about what's going on with your child rather than them feeling blamed or um, like they've done something wrong. Stay positive and supportive, um, which is great advice to all parents at all times. We want to stay positive and supportive, which is hard. It's also hard when you're facing things that look really scary, like bleeding wounds and, and things that are visible to others. And on, if you're honest, I mean, a lot of clients have been very vulnerable and honest with me and said, yeah, I worry that people are going to judge me or I'm embarrassed. You know, my child is walking around with a giant bald spot or picked places all over and it. I feel embarrassed. And, and so really talking to someone or, or getting support from your loved ones about what you're struggling with um, so that you can stay positive and supportive with your child. Reducing the focus on outcomes. Um, it's important to not focus on hair and skin because what can take eight weeks to grow can take eight minutes to, to remove. 
right? Especially with eyelashes and eyebrows. And so if, if your child does eight weeks of amazing work and has eight minutes where they remove it all, we don't want to focus on that eight minutes. We want to focus on the eight weeks. But I, then I might ask, okay, but well, let's talk about what happened this time. What was different? And then go into that problem solving mode. You want to stay calm, especially when you see the BFRB in action. And honestly, sometimes you may have to leave the room. You may have to leave the room. Um, and, and especially if your child has said, please do not comment on my BFRB. Look for a trained therapist in your area. BFRB.org has a, a therapist referral list, which is super helpful to locate people. Um, if you're in an area where you don't have someone trained, there are many provisors that do online treatment. Um, and so I would look there. There's also this um, treatment manual coming out. So therapists could read a treatment manual and help your child in that way. Be sensitive when talking to friends and family about the BFRB. I always ask parents to talk to their child first or we talk about it. Do you want your mom and dad to let people know? I think that keeping it a secret shames the child. It makes it sound like it's a really awful, dirty little secret that we can't talk about. So I really encourage parents to normalize it and say, oh yeah, it's just no big deal. It's like nail biting, which it actually is. Um, very much like nail biting and we're working on it. So um, if you, you know, and, and then if your child gives you permission, you might even say, oh, you, if you see him doing it, maybe you could suggest this, or maybe you could respond in this way. Or if you see him doing it, please don't respond at all. Um, now, sometimes kids will ask their buddies, hey, if you see me, you know, picking my nails or biting my nails, will you point it out to me? Sometimes kids do want that, but I love it when it comes from them. So get respectfully curious. Um, and, and, and timing is everything. You know, what... Um, Tell me about that today. What happened today? What was different? Uh, I'm curious. So being curious um, and not appearing judgmental or, or shaming. Um, so summing up the basics, be kind. Um, people with BFRBs tend to be perfectionistic and can be very hard on themselves. I imagine their parents can too. So be kind to yourself. Be kind to your child. Know that behavior change is a journey. It is not perfect. It's a it's a forward and backward movement. So know that going into it, um, you're not alone. There are um, many, many parents out there going through the same struggle that you're going through. Um, behavior therapy is helpful and it works, but it requires effort, energy, and a willingness to tolerate some difficult times, some rough patches. So um, it's important to, to really to know that and that timing is everything. If you have a lot going on in your family, if you have a lot going on, um, if your child has a lot going on, maybe this isn't the right time. You know, if if you're going through a divorce and it's really hectic and your child's pulling their hair out, this may not be the right time. Maybe we have bigger fish to fry than the hair pulling and so our, our skin picking. And so we really want to make sure that we're at a place of um, having the bandwidth and the energy and the space for for dealing with that issue. So finally, resources. I just wanted to reiterate the TLC, TLC Foundation for BFRBs. And there are lots of books out there. I've listed a few here. One that I authored with Ruth Gollum, A Parent Guide to Hair Pulling Disorder for Parents Out There and for Therapists Out There, The Comprehensive or Comb Treatment of Body Focused Repetitive Behaviors, a Clinical Guide. It's coming out next month. So um I wanted to thank you very much and open it up for questions. Um, I wanted to make sure that we had enough time for that. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Mouton Odom. That was incredibly informative and um, delivered with such kindness. So, so thank you so much. Um, before we start the Q&A, I will do a quick thank you to Play Attention once more for sponsoring today's webinar. And um, you can see the results from our um, survey that most, uh, about a quarter of people um, reported that negative emotions, stress and anxiety were the most common triggers for their child's BFRBs. Um, and then behind that was skin irregularities, acne, eczema, um, anything that kind of might draw attention. Um, those were definitely the leaders in the pack. And then um, implements, uh, sensory triggers like itchy clothing and settings, um, really interesting set of results. Um, so I did want to ask, we had a number of parents who were 
concerned about infection, especially with skin picking, if you could offer a script for parents who obviously want to address um, with an antibiotic and a Band-Aid, but to do so in a way that is not shaming. Absolutely. Great question. And, and it is a big concern. I mean, skin picking more so than hair pulling can lead to bodily harm. Um, the only bodily harm you can get from hair pulling is ingesting hair, which about 13% of people do. Um, but with skin picking, you know, besides scarring, which is, you know, um, bodily harm, but, but infection. And so making sure as with anything, if your child stubbed their toe or, or, or cut themselves, we would use antibiotic wash, we would apply some antibiotic ointment, and we would put a Band-Aid on it. And Band-Aids are actually incredible barriers for skin picking, especially if there is one area that a person keeps going back to. And they actually, I bought some the other day, make these, um, it's like a Band-Aid cover, and it covers a large area, and it stays on even through showering, so you can keep it on even for a week or two. And so the whole process of caring for the wound, and as far as the script, it would be like, oh, honey, I noticed that um, you're bleeding. Let's go ahead and let's pay some attention to that. But I would, you want to be careful because you don't want to positively reinforce it. So like, oh, sweetie, the, le the comfort and the, oh, this is so hard. And um, I, you might do that later. But in that moment, I would say, let's, let's do what we need to do. Let's put, let's wash it. And then we're going to put some antibiotic ointment and a Band-Aid and we're going to cover it up. Um, it, they may not want that and they may not want it for a variety of reasons. Some kids don't like the sensation of Band-Aids, but you, I would really encourage you to find the right Band-Aid because Band-Aids come in a variety of different textures and thicknesses and sensations. And for those sensory oriented kids, it's super important to get the right one. Um, and, and it also know that it can be a good barrier so that they can't go back to that same spot and allow it to heal over a few days, which is usually how long it takes. Okay. Wonderful. Um, and you spoke about CBT being the recommended treatment. Um, what are some signs that parents can look for that CBT is making a positive forward motion with their child? How can they feel some confidence that they are um, moving in the right direction when, as you said, it can take six weeks for the hair to grow and six seconds for it to be removed? Exactly. Or six minutes. Yes, so I sorry. think that six seconds would be, most people pull one hair at a time. That would be really hard to remove a whole lot, but, <laughs> but, but you're right. It's fast. And so what we want to look for, as I said, is engagement doing the things that the therapist and that they have decided would be helpful, um, whether those are sensory oriented fidgets or barriers such as gloves or finger protectors or band-aids, um, socks, long, long, you know, pants, long sleeves, um, removing magnifying mirrors, removing tweezers and implements, um, covering mirrors. I mean, there's hundreds of interventions, but what we, what we're looking for is engagement. That's all we're looking for. Um, the hair will grow, the skin will heal if the child is engaging. Um, and so when you check in with your child, it's not, the question isn't, did you pull today? It's how are you doing with using your strategies? How's that going? And then help them problem solve. Oh, I forget to bring my strategies when I watch TV. We'll get a little basket and put it by the TV and fill it with things that would be helpful. Um, so that, again, speaks to problem solving and helping them to be more successful because we're the parents that are the, we're the means to that. We have to buy the things. We have to go on Amazon and order the things. I'll get you more Band-Aids, no problem, but let's put them here, here, and here. I'll get you a hat. We have 10 hats. Let's put them here, 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 and here. So, so it's, it's, again, about engagement. Well, that's a great reminder. Um, and speaking of which, uh, engagement, is there a way to involve your child's teacher in this plan? Um, again, you, you were very clear about speaking with your child about what is most helpful, of course. Um, but aside from, from that, um, any pointers for parents who want to bring the teacher on board in helping this process? Sure. I think that, um, it depends on the teacher and 
I would always educate the teacher about BFRBs, um, either have the parent educate the teacher or have the therapist of the child educate the teacher and be very specific about what the teacher can do that would be helpful. Because well-meaning teachers oftentimes think they're doing the right thing, but um, aren't. Like they might see the child in the back of the room. Well, if the child has ADHD, they don't need to be in the back of the room. You know what the teacher might think? Oh, well, they're pulling their hair and the kids can see them. So let me just move the child. And we don't want to do that. What we want to do is um, whatever is helpful for the child. And it might be going by their desk and putting some ticky tack on it very discreetly. We do not want to call the child out in the middle of the classroom. That's the last thing we want to do. But I've seen teachers do it a hundred times. Well-meaning, hey, put your hand down. That that is incredibly shaming to that child potentially. So we want to be we want to encourage the teacher to be respectful and kind of problem solve with them. How would that work? Or if you see the child's really struggling, we might ask the teacher if the child can go run an errand. Hey, little Susie, can you run to the principal's office and and take this? And it might just be a piece of paper that says take five minutes and come back. And um, and so we want to work these things out with the teacher by giving them instructions on what would be helpful and also educating them about BFRBs and that these aren't a sign of any deeper psychopathology or that something really bad is going on in the household that, Hey, we're, we're working on this and we're a team and this is what's been recommended to us. And and you can be part of our team too, but we want to educate that team member. Wonderful. And this may be a great time to mention that this webinar will be available for replay. So if you do have a teacher or another loved one uh, in your life who you think would benefit from all of this fantastic knowledge about BFRBs, know uh, that you can share this um, widely. (laughs) Um, So let's see. Another common question here, of course, we're dealing with a lot of comorbidities, ADHD is just one of them, but a number of people wondering, can ADHD, is there any research to suggest that ADHD medications could either exacerbate uh, slash trigger BFRBs or improve them? That's a great question. And it's a very common one. There's an assumption that ADHD medication makes ticks and hair pulling and skin picking and um, a lot of behavioral things worse. And there is some evidence there. There are very few studies done, but um, one or two studies that suggest that there are also studies that suggest that it improves the outcomes. So it's inconclusive. We don't know. And maybe that just depends on the child. But what I would say is ADHD is far more damaging for for the lifetime of that child than hair pulling or skin picking. So you always want to treat the ADHD. That trumps the hair pulling and skin picking, even if it were to make it worse, because the the long-term outcomes of an untreated attention deficit are worse than the long-term outcomes of hair pulling and skin picking. And so, so we want to treat the ADHD. It might be shuffling the meds around. Oh, that one did make it worse. Let's try this other one. And sometimes different meds work differently for different kids. So you might play with that a little bit, but it wouldn't be a reason to not treat the ADHD, in my opinion, uh, because we want this child to learn, to be successful, to um, have every advantage that the other children in the classroom have. And then we'll work through the the BFRB. We'll figure that out, but let's, let's treat the ADHD. Wonderful. I do have one last question I'm going to try and squeeze in here as we're running out of time, but um, I felt it was really poignant. Uh, Someone wrote in live today that my nine-year-old thinks she's the only kid who's ever pulled their hair. I don't know how to let her know that she's not alone without putting undue attention on the behavior. Can you offer any advice or talking points um, that can offer some solace? Well, yes. And I'm just, my heart goes out to you and your child. That's so sweet. And and so undue attention really is more of the reminding, the nagging, the, um, the policing. So there are books out there that um, are for children. One is called Feathers, about a bird that lost its feathers. There's another one that a client brought in earlier this week. I can't recall the name of it, but I'm sure if you look on Amazon um, and they're written for kids, 
I mean, and I'll tell, I'll pull books out and go, there are books written on this. They don't write books about stuff that only one person has. Like lots of people have this. Um, there, if you go to the BFRB website, I believe that there are some videos of kids sitting around. There used to be a video. I think it was called the heart, heart video. Um, and it was about kids talking about having a BFRB. It's the sweetest thing. And so letting your child know you're not alone. This is actually not that uncommon. Um, most people have heard of tick disorders or Tourette. It's way, way more common than Tourette. Um, it's about as common as OCD. Lots of people have heard of OCD. And they use it in common. People like say, oh, I'm so OCD when they're not. People want to be OCD. This, this is as common as that. It's just that people don't talk about it. And so it's, it's been hard to get awareness out there. We know of movie stars and people that, um, that have trichotillomania and they just won't come out and talk about it publicly. So we're working really hard to get the awareness out there through the TLC Foundation. And I see we're out of time. We are. Um, I hate to end it because uh, I have just learned so much personally, and I know that our audience has really appreciated your time, your attention, and also your uh, your willingness to speak out um, and to set the record straight and to offer some real strategies for parents. So I think we're on the road to um, increasing the spotlight and making fewer kids feel like they are alone. So Thank you so much for that. Um, and I want to thank everyone who joined us today. And I hope that you will join us again for another Attitude webinar. Our next one is quite different, but ADHD, Pregnancy, and Motherhood, A Practical Guide for Hopeful Parents with uh, Dr. Allison Baker. That's next week. So if you want to make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming webinars, you can sign up to get our email alerts at attitudemag.com slash newsletters. Uh, for now, I hope you have a wonderful day. And uh, Dr. Mutan Odom, thank you so much again. Thank you.